foremost, sign Christ's blessings, uh, Captain Lemuel. I know you. I see uh, Dallas. Give all praise to the Most High out here in OKC for our brother, Officer Ezra's uh, uh, funeral service. Um, and it was amazing to see, you know, 150, 200 uh, brothers and sisters. That was just of who could make it. That that wasn't even that wasn't even everybody. That was just of who could make it. Um, and so it kind of, and I struggled with this class because I had one direction. I thought I was just going to do part two of the class I did back in July. And then a brother sent me an article. So that kind of veered me in another direction with the white nationalism. And I, I keep calling white nationalism. It's the same thing, Christian nationalism. Um, and then, um, of course, with the, uh, you know, with the service and the passing, the, the scriptures that uh, Bishop and Deacon were bringing out last night, you know, kind of, you know, brought things, um, you know, gave me some some clarity, and and so I wanted to touch on Ecclesiastes nine and dealing with death. So this will kind of be just an addendum to the actual class. We're gonna go go through a couple of verses. I'm not gonna go precept upon precept. Uh, Officer Razis said he gonna keep me on point, so he gonna keep me on point. All right, but I want to touch on Ecclesiastes nine just to to frame our minds around these last days, how we are to conduct ourselves, how we are to deal with our wives, our children, uh, a good name amongst Israel, a good conscience with the Lord, all of that we're going to read through as we read through Ecclesiastes 9. Again, this is just kind of the first half, and then we'll actually get into the class. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 1. This is the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 9 and verse 1. For all this I considered in my heart, even to declare all this, that the righteous and the wise and their works are in the hand of God. No man knoweth either love or hatred by all that is before them. Mm -hmm. All things come alike to all. So all things come alike to all of us. Go ahead. There's one event to the righteous and to the wicked. So keep in mind, there's one event. We're talking about an event that happens to all, the righteous and the wicked. To the good and to the clean, and to the unclean, to him that sacrificeth, and to him that sacrificeth not. Uh -huh. As is the good, so is the sinner, and he that sweareth, as he that feareth an oath. So, yes, yeah, he that feareth an oath. Go ahead. This is an evil among all things that are done under the sun. So this one event that Solomon is talking about, he said is what? This is an evil among all things that are done under the sun. He said this is an evil that's done. Go ahead. That there is one event unto all. Yea, also the heart of the sons of men is full of evil. The heart is referring to the mind. The mind of the sons of men is full of evil. Go ahead. And madness is in their heart while they live. And after that, they go to the dead. So what's that one event that happens to all of us? Death. Death is that one event that happens to all of us, the good, the evil, the righteous, the unrighteous, those that sacrifice, those that don't sacrifice. Death happens to us all. Solomon said this is an evil among all things that are done under the sun. Hold that. Wisdom of Solomon chapter 1. This is an evil that's done. Chapter 1, uh, just read verse 13. Was of Solomon, chapter 1 and verse 13. For God made not death, neither hath he pleasure in the destruction of the living. So God made not death. God made not death. It says, neither hath he pleasure in the destruction of the living. Jump over to chapter 2. So it said, God made not death. Chapter 2, remember this is wisdom of Solomon. So this is Solomon still speaking. He said... Chapter 2, verse 23. Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 2 and verse 23. For God created man to be immortal. So God didn't make death. He, he created man to be immortal. He created Adam to live forever. Adam was a god on the earth. He created him to live forever and his seed. Go ahead. And made him to be an image of his own eternity. Uh -huh. Nevertheless... However, nevertheless, however, through envy of the devil came death into the world. Because of spiritual fornication, 
Because of idolatry, it says what? Nevertheless, through envy of the devil came death into the world. And they that do it, hold of his side, do find it. And they that do hold of his side, do find it. So, all, so through envy of the devil, through sin, death came into the world. But that was not so from the beginning. That was man's doing. So when we go back to Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 3, it says, This is an evil among all things that are done under the sun. Because of sin, death came into the world. But we were created to be immortal. It says, also the heart of the sons of men is full of evil. Remember what Christ said, and we don't got to get it, but remember what Christ said in, what is it, Mark? Mark 7? Mark 9? Now I got to get it. Is it Mark 7? Yeah, yeah, Mark 7, 21. Yeah, Mark 7, 21. When he said, uh, out of the heart of men proceed evil thoughts, fornication, adultery, uh, theft, covetousness, covetousness, so on and so forth. Those are the evils that are in the hearts of men, that are in the minds of men. Read on. Go back to Ecclesiastes chapter 9. So he said, because of this, there's one event that happens to all of us. It's death. Death. Go ahead. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verse 4. For to him that is joined to all the living, there is hope. For a living dog. It says, for to him that is joined to all the living, there is hope. So as long as you're in the land of the living, there is hope in re to repent. There is hope to not receive a final judgment of eternal damnation, eternal destruction. While you're in the land of the living. Go ahead. For a living dog is better than a dead lion. It's better for you to be living weak, feeble, than to be strong and be, and read that last part again. For a living dog is better than a dead lion. Than a dead lion in the grave. Hold that, Sirach 17. Sirach, Ecclesiastes chapter 17, start at verse 24. Sirach chapter 17 and verse 24. But unto them that repent, he granted them return. And so the Lord said, uh, but unto them that repent, because it's better to be a living dog, you can only repent on this side. You can only repent in the land of the living. It says, for all unto them that repent, he granted them return and comforted those that failed in patience. He comforted those. How does the Lord comfort us? Through the scriptures. Through his commandments. Through his laws. That's how God comforts us. Go ahead. Verse 25. Return unto the Lord and forsake thy sins. So God said, in the land of the living, there is hope. The hope is that you return to the Lord. That you hear the words of God and you return to the Lord before death. Go ahead. Make thy prayer before his face and offend less. And sin less. That's the ultimate goal in this life. Sin less. When you first come in, you still got your training wheels on. You still trying to get your feet up under you because you've lived a life of sin 20, 30, 40, 50 years. But you got to give all praise to the most high that while you're in the land of the living, he can comfort you in his scriptures and grant you return. Grant you the opportunity to repent. Go ahead. Turn again to the Most High and turn away from iniquity. Turn away from sin. Go ahead. For he will lead thee out of darkness into the light of health. Into the light of health. Into the light of his commandments. Go ahead. And hate thou abominations vehemently. And hate your sin vehemently. Not play with it. Not twink, uh, tinker with it. God said to hate your sin vehemently. That means with a passion. Because it's, it was born in us. We were shaped in it. Born in the sin, shaped in iniquity. So God said, one tip is to hate it. If you don't hate it and you still got a, a, a fondness for it, it's going to be a lot easier for you to fall back into it. Whatever your vice is. Go ahead, uh, what verse you with? That was verse 26. Uh, read on. You're going to read through 29. Yes, sir. Who shall praise the most high in the grave? So 
it says, who will praise God in the grave? To praise God, to keep his commandments. Who's going to praise God in the grave? No one. Go ahead. Instead of them which live and give thanks. Only those that live and give thanks can give praises to the Most High. Can give thanksgiving to the Most High. For giving us all an opportunity at repentance. Every day you wake up, you have an opportunity at repentance. Every day you wake up, the Most High is giving you grace. The Most High is giving you another day to get it right. Another day to get a clue. Another day to overcome your sin. Another day to, to implant in your spirit that hatred, that vehement hatred for your sins. Go ahead. Thanksgiving perisheth from the dead. Because thanksgiving, giving praises to the Most High, worshiping the Most High, that perishes in the grave. When that flesh is in the ground, that thanksgiving, that's no more. You can't do it. That repentance, that chance that you had to get it right, that's done. Go ahead. As from one that is not, the living and sound in heart shall praise the Lord. The living and sound in mind. Praise the Lord. How do you make sure you have a sound mind? By applying God's commandments. That's how you have a sound mind. That's the only way you have a sound mind. Not by white man therapy. Not by the medications. That's not how you have a sound mind. Because a lot of y'all, y'all, you're going to take uh, uh, white man uh, prescribe the medications, and I'm not saying if you own medications, you, you do what you do. But what I'm saying is the white man making a lot of good money because off of our sins because we have not implanted the laws of God in our minds and our spirits because we haven't applied God's commandments to give us that sound mind. So you want to know how to have a sound mind, you apply God's commandments. Go ahead. Verse 29. How great is the loving kindness of the Lord our God and his compassion unto such as turn unto him in holiness. And you, you would pray that through your prayer and fasting that you would be able to overcome whatever um, external factors, external medications or whatever. Talking about the mind, your depression medications and all that stuff. You would pray that over time that you would be able to wing yourself off as you're, as you're building a solid foundation, you're building a solid mind through the commandments of the Lord. Read that part again, uh, verse 29. Yes, sir. How great is the loving kindness of the Lord our God. How great is the loving kindness of God. Go ahead. And his compassion unto such as turn unto him in holiness. As turn unto him in holiness. We must turn to God in holiness in the land of the living. Because you can't do it after the fact. Let's go back. Go back. Go back. <laughs> chapter 9, verse 5. Yes, sir. Ecclesiastes, chapter 9, and verse 5. For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. Neither have they any more a reward. For the memory of them is forgotten. Because when, we, when you die, we mourn for a time and then... We move on, you know, we, we move on because we, we still got a life to live. And it's not to say that those memories don't come up. It's not to say that uh, they don't come up in moments in time. But in the grave, that's it. All we have are those memories. Go ahead. Also, their love and their hatred and their envy is now perished. Not so you can't, in the grave, you can't love, you can't hate. You can't envy. You can't do any of those things in the grave. Go ahead. Neither have they any more a portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. You can't. There is no work. There is no raising your children. There is no loving your wife. There's none of that in the grave. Go ahead. Go thy way. So watch this. So now Solomon says, with all that being said, understanding that your memory's forgotten, understanding that there's no thanksgiving, there's no love, there's no hatred. He said what? Go thy way. He said go your way. Come on. Eat thy bread with joy and drink thy wine with a merry heart. For God now accepteth thy works. So he said go your way. Eat, drink, be merry. He said God accepts your works. Why does God accept your works? Because you've repented in the land of the living. 
because you've turned away from your sins. You've hated your abominations vehemently. You've turned to God in holiness. Go ahead. Let thy garments be always white. So watch this. Solomon said, let your garments be always white. What does he mean by let your garments be always white? Get that in Revelation chapter 19, and I didn't write it now, unfortunately. Revelation chapter 19, verse, you can read 7 and 8. Revelations chapter 19 and verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. The, the, the marriage is between Israel and Christ. Go ahead. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen. That Israel would be arrayed in fine linen. Go ahead. Clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. So when Solomon said, let thy garments be always white, what was he really saying? Be righteous. Be righteous. Live righteously in the land of the living. Let's get some more of that. Psalms chapter 132, verse 9. Actually, get Job first. Get Job 29 and 14. What did Solomon mean when he said, let your garments be always white? Job 29, verse 14. I put on righteousness, and I clothed, and it clothed me. My judgment was as a robe and a didum. He said, uh, Job said, I put on righteousness, and it clothed me. Because that righteousness is the fine linen that Solomon was referring to in Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Solomon is saying in the land of the living, live righteously. Live an honest life. Live a sincere life. Live a life of integrity. Don't live a life where nobody can trust you. Nobody can trust your word. You're a habitual fornicator. You're a habitual idolater. You getting put out the body every every other year. You don't show up to the feast days. You love your worldly family love more than you love your body, uh, love the body, more than you love your righteous family. You'll do more for your righteous family than you will for your family in the truth. Don't live a why live a life like that, knowing you know who you are, knowing that you're the greatest thing walking the face of the planet. Read that, uh, go to Psalms 132 now. Psalms 132, read verse, verse 9. Psalms chapter 132 and verse 9. Let thy priests be clothed with righteousness. Let thy priests be, we're the priests. Let thy priests be clothed with righteousness. Go ahead. And let thy saints shout for joy. And let thy saints shout for joy. Give praises to the Most High. Last one on that. Sirach chapter 27 verse 8. Sirach, Ecclesiastes chapter 27 and verse 8. Let thy garments be always white. Sirach chapter 27 verse 8. If thou followest righteousness, thou shalt obtain her. And if you follow God's commandments, and apply them to your life. Go ahead. And put her on as a glorious long robe. Put her on as a glorious long robe. So when Solomon said in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, let's go back. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verse 8. Let thy garments be always white. Solomon said your works are accepted for, by God. So be righteous, be sincere, live a life of integrity. Go ahead. And let thy head lack no, no ointment. And let thy, and anoint yourself, anoint your family, your wife, your children. Go ahead. Live joyfully with the wife whom thou lovest all the days of thy life, of thy vanity. So we read this in isolation a lot of times. When you read it in conjunction, conjunction with the rest of the chapter, Solomon has given us a tip. He said, while you're in the land of the living, before you die, live joyfully with the wife of your youth. Live joyfully. 
It shouldn't be you're arguing every other day. You're fighting every other day. You're committing fornication. You're committing adultery every other year. You can't move in one singular direction and complete one singular goal together because you want to go left, she want to go right. You want to make good memories while you're in the land of the living. Take pictures. Go to the feast days. Travel when you have the opportunity. Love your wife. Raise your children. In sincerity, in truth. It shouldn't be that your house is a, a freaking prison house. It's the, the whole house is just depressed. No, ain't nobody having no fun. Y'all can sister, 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 you can't laugh in my house. What the hell? You can't laugh? My Lord, I can't laugh. I can't have no fun. So all we going to do for, for 12 hours, we're we not going to have no music playing. We're not going to, we just going to. We, sister, all we do is read the Bible here. And this is this is all you're gonna do for the next eight hours. Okay, all right. Ecclesiastes chapter nine, verse one. Okay. Damn. How your whole house depressed, bruh. Look what Solomon said. With all his wisdom, read that again. Ecclesiastes chapter nine and verse nine. Live joyfully. With the wife whom thou lovest all the days of thy life of thy vanity. Bruh, if you love your wife, live joyfully. Bring joy to the house. You should be the, false, the, the, the foremost forerunner of joy in the house. Not depression. Not slavery. Damn, captivity is hard enough. You giving her a double portion at the crib. Go ahead. <laughs> Which he hath given thee under the sun. All the days of thy vanity, mm -hmm. for that is thy portion in this life. She is your portion in this life. So you want to make good memories. That's a, she's who you got. So make good memories. Go ahead. And in thy labor, which thou takest under the sun, uh -huh. whatsoever thy hand findeth to do. So now here's another tip. Whatsoever your hand finds to do. Do it with Thy might. Before you die, live joy. I'm, I'm going to run it down again. Let your garments be always white. Anoint your head. Live joyfully with your wife. Whatsoever you find, your hand finds to do. Do it with thy might. Do it with your might. Before you die, before you go to the grave, Solomon said, let your garments be white. Anoint your head with oil. Live joyfully with the wife of your youth. And do the work. Do the work. Read on. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave, whether thou goest. Because you can't do it when you die. You can't do it from the grave. Uh, what is that? Baruch uh, 4 or 3, when he said, um, it was your mind to go astray, seeking ten times more. Y'all yeah, know what I'm Okay, yes, sir. Baruch chapter 4, verse 28. For as it was your mind to go astray from God, so being returned, seek him ten times more. He said, so Solomon said, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. Baruch said, for it was your mind to go astray since you returned. We just read about being returned, repenting in the land of the living in Sirach 17. He said, seek the Lord ten times more. It's the same thing Solomon said. Do the work and do it with all your might. All right, so that was just an addendum to, um, just an addendum to the class. I pray y'all got something out of that, that first portion. Now we're going to get into the actual class. But again, really think about that. Process your life in this truth up to the point where you are right now. Can you say that you live a joyful life? With your, with your wife, if you, obviously, if you're married. Can you say that you're doing the work with all your might? Or is there, more, is there more gas in the tank? Can you say that you are living a righteous life, an honest life, a life of integrity? 
a sincere life? Do you have a good conscience towards God? Because you don't know when your time is, when your time is up in this life. You don't know. So you always got to take a step back, self-examine, self-reflect, because nobody knows, but you, other than the, the things that we can, okay, we, we know you committed fornication. You got put out. Okay, we know you lied about this particular situation. The truth came out two months later, whatever. Or you brought, you know, you brought it out. But the things that are hidden deep within in your spirit, the spirit of your mind, reflect on those things. Because remember, Solomon said that the heart, our hearts are full of evil. We have to continually, continually reflect, continually take a step back, self-examine. Where am I at in my walk? Do I have a clear conscience towards God? If I was to drop today, tonight, tomorrow, am I guaranteed? Do I have, do I have a surety that I have a good conscience with God? Or there's some secret sins that I need to rid my spirit of? Is there some hatred that I need to overcome? Do I have an art with a brother or a sister? Am I raising my children right? Or am I neglecting the spiritual growth of my children? So, so self-examine, self-examine, all right? All right, now we're going to get into the class. I am God. I change not. Uh, not race, grace. Uh, Christian nationalism and grace, all right? I had to, I had to think about that for a second because it's, it's long. All right, all right, all right, all right. So let's go to Job chapter 9, verse 24. So like I said, I, I struggle with this one because I had a direction I was going, then a brother sent me an article, and then it took me in a whole nother direction. Not a whole nother direction, but a different direction than what I wanted to go before. But I want to show y'all uh, the correlations between America, the eighth beast that came out of the seventh which was Rome, ancient Rome. Rome is still in power, still in power. And how in these last days, the Lord is extending much grace and mercy to us to overcome the, the different wiles of the devil, the different wiles of Satan that are, gonna, that are going to come up, that we're going to run into, that we're going to have to go into, that we're going to have to fight, we're going to have to battle. The Lord is extending much, extending much grace and and mercy, and we're going to see that as we go throughout the class. So, Job chapter 9, verse 24. Job chapter 9 and verse 24. The earth is given into the hand of the wicked. So, God said the earth is given into the hand of the wicked. Not a little plot of land. The earth was given into the hand of the wicked. The hand of the wicked. Go ahead. He covered the faces of the judges thereof. So, as... The righteous seed, God's children, are living in an earth, living in lands that were given into the hand of the wicked. What do you think goes on within those lands? All manner of sin, idolatry, fornication, murder, theft, and everything else under the sun. All the evils out of the minds of men, out of the hearts of men that we mentioned in Ecclesiastes 9, that we quoted in Mark, uh, Mark chapter 7. Go from there. So now, let's pull up this first video. Baptist leader speaks out Christian nationalism is not Christianity. And I didn't give you the timestamps, actually. We're going to go to a minute and 11 seconds. Because we are Americans, and Americans kneel to God and God alone. Hey, y'all. I'm John Avalon. And this is Reality Check on the Extremist Beat. We've got to talk about Christian nationalism. Because it's gone from a fringe belief system advocated by a few folks on the far right to an increasingly prominent article of political faith inside the Republican Party. In recent months, it's been celebrated by some of the Trumpiest members of Congress. We need to be the party of nationalism, and I'm a Christian, and I say it proudly. We should be Christian nationalists. The church is supposed to direct 
the government. The government is not supposed to direct the church. That is not how our founding fathers intended it. And I'm tired of this separation of church and state junk. And that's not all. Christian nationalism also reared its head in the January 6th attack on Congress. Thank you, divine, omniscient, omnipotent, and omnipresent creator God for filling this chamber with your white light of love. Now, you might ask. All right, so Edom, Esau, Idomia here in America. There, there's other nations, but obviously we're, we're talking about America. There are other nations, Germany and some other places where they're, they're talking about Christian nationalism. But you see that they don't want a separation of church and state. But as we go through, you're going to see that there's never been a difference between church and state. And it's written. It is written. So let's go to that next article. Let's go to the wiki. So y'all see how America sets themselves up as a Christian nation, a God-fearing nation. Hmm. Hmm, hmm, hmm. So we're going to start Christian nationalism, and then you're going to stop at uh, social life. Christian nationalism. Christian nationalism is Christianity affiliated, affiliated religious nationalism. Christian nation, nationalists pri primarily focus on eternal politics. They, they primarily focus on what? Eternal politics. Internal politics. Such as passing laws that reflect their view of Christianity and its role in political and social life. So their focus is on political and social life. Political and social life. Let's scroll down till you see United States. So you see all these different countries. Scroll back up a little bit. Uh, you see Russia, Canada, all these European nations. Scroll up. Let me see that list. Scroll up just a little bit. Canada, Russia, United States, Yugoslavia. <laughs> All these Edomite countries. All right, scroll down. Let's, uh, United States. United States, the Christian Liberty Party is a political party that sees the United States as a Christian country. Scroll down. Oh, no, yeah, that next one, I'm sorry. Christian nationalists believe that the U.S. is meant to be a Christian nation and want to take back the U.S. for God. They want to take back America for God. They want to take back America for God. You mean the same country that was stolen from the Native Americans, the whole northern kingdom, you want to take back a land that was raped, robbed, pillaged of its resources, you want to take back a land and give it back to God. So God ordained you to rape, rob, and murder the people that was already here? Hmm. Hmm. Uh, scroll down. You're going to see Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor. Yep. Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greeny has referred to herself as a Christian nationalist. Fellow Congressman Lorraine Congresswomen. Congresswoman Lorraine Bobrett and Mary Miller have also expressed support for Christian nationalism. So you have uh, political figures, congressmen, congresswomen, that express support for Christian nationalism. Go ahead. Or taking back the country to God, giving it back to God. Go ahead. Chris Kobach has described himself as a Christian nationalist. White nationalist Nick Fuentes. Fuentes has expressed support for Christian nationalism. In the United States, there are concerns. So you have white nationalists that support Christian nationalism. That's why I got jammed up earlier. It's the same thing. Go ahead. In the United States, there are concerns from critics of racism, racism and anti-democratic sentiment associated with the white Christian nationalist movement. You see, now you see how they merged them together. Now it's not Christian nationalism, it's white Christian nationalist movement. There's no such thing as a black Christian nationalist. They telling you right here, in the US, there are concerns from critics of racism and anti-democratic sentiment associated with the white Christian nationalist movement. 
Christian nationalism ain't got nothing to do with blacks and Hispanics. They telling you right here. Let's go back to the video. You're going to start at a minute 26. You're right. And we're a recent stop study at by the Baptist Joint Committee for I'm Religious sorry, I'm Liberty. Sorry, take it back. Listed I talked over it. Five core narrative beliefs by the Baptist a lot. As usual in a democratic republic. The answer is a lot. So let's clarify our terms here, right? A recent study by the Baptist Joint Committee for Religious Liberty listed five core narrative beliefs of Christian nationalists. One. America is a divinely appointed nation by God that is Christian. Two, America's founders were in fact establishing a nation based on Christian principles with white men as the leaders. Three. You say with who? Hold up. Go back. America's, pause it, America's founders, rather than wanting to disestablish religion, as a unifier for the nation, we're in fact establishing a nation based on Christian, Christian principles with white men as the leaders. With white men as the leaders. I got to find something. Now I got to find something. Hold up. Uh, play on. I'll as the it. leaders. Three others would be Native Americans, enslaved Africans, and immigrants would accept and cede to this narrative of America as a Christian nation and accept their leadership. Four. All right, hold up, hold up, take it back, take it back. So he said others, Native Americans, enslaved Africans and immigrants, would accept and cede to this narrative of America as a Christian nation and accept their leadership. So guess what? Everything that you've learned about Christianity, the Bible, has been given to you, has been force-fed to you. You blacks, Hispanics, and Native Americans, they telling you on video, this is CNN. This ain't no made-up uh, article. This ain't a video we just put together. This is CNN, Caucasian News Network. And they telling you, Blacks and Hispanics, they're going to do what we tell them to do. They're going to accept white Jesus, and we don't give a damn. We don't care if they like it or not. Where are they going to go? Where the hell y'all going to go? Y'all going to go back home? Where is home? Uh, play on. America as a Christian nation and accept their leadership. Four, America has a special place, not only in world history, but in biblical scripture especially concerning the return of Christ. Five. Okay, hold up, hold up, hold up. Go back to that. All right, read that. America has a special place, not only in world history, but in biblical scripture. It sure does, and we're going to read about it. Especially concerning the return of Christ. Especially concerning the return of Christ. If they ain't got nothing right, they got that right. Now, Officer Jonathan, I just sent you a screenshot from a book that I have entitled The Other Slavery, and I want you to read something. We're going to read something real quick. Huh? Okay. All right. From there, so let's read this real quick. Let's read Revelation chapter 13, verse 11. Revelation chapter 13, verse 11. Revelations chapter 13 and verse 11. And I behold another beast. It says, and I beheld another beast. This, this other beast, America, go ahead. Coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb. And that beast had two horns. The two horns is your dem Democrat and Republican parties. Your politics. Go ahead. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb. Like a lamb. Like a lamb. Why like a lamb? Why not like a fish or a dove? The lamb of God. Christianity. Christianity. Religion. 
It says, two horns like a lamb. Go ahead. And he spake as a dragon. And he spake as a dragon. Secret plots. Popular persuasions. Just like they had against the children of Israel in, Rome, uh, in ancient Rome. Just like they had against the children of Israel in ancient Greece. They spake like a dragon. They set up policies against the children of Israel. Abortion rights. But I don't want to get ahead of myself. I don't want to get ahead of myself. Now, we're going to read the part in the blue. We're going to read the portion in the blue. This is a book. This is a book called The Other Slavery. In the end, the Mormons became buyers and even found a way to rationalize their participation in this human market. This human market is talking about slavery, slave trading. Go ahead. By up the laminate Indian. And, and it said Mormons. We're talking about Christians. Christians. Go ahead. Buy up the laminate Indian children. So buy up the Indian children. Go ahead. We're talking about the Native Americans here in America. Go ahead. Bridgeham Young concealed his counsel, counseled his brethren in the town of Par Parwan. Parwan. So he counseled other Edomites. Brigham Young, go ahead. And educate them. So, and, and so here was his counsel. He said, buy up the laminate children and. And educate them. And educate them. And teach them the gospel. And teach them Christianity. So that. They ain't, gonna, they ain't got a choice. That's what these white nationalists just told you on, that, on the video we just seen but from CNN. Go ahead. And educate them and teach them the gospel so that many generations will not. Past. So that because they had a long game in mind, they said because for many generations would not pass or er, er, they should become a white and the light some people that they would make the Native American Indians white folks. Their whole Christian nationalism didn't start in 2022 or 2021 or 2019. We're going all the way back to 1492 and beyond. Christian nationalism started when the conquistadors came over here and started to conquer and pillage North America, the fourth part of the earth, as the scripture says. It says, and their goal was to teach the Native American Indians the gospel and make them a white and delightsome people. That's how they justified slavery. Go ahead. This was? This was the same logic Spanish conquistadors had used in the That's it. now there's one I sent them another one. Yep. In the sixteenth century to justify the inquisition the of acquisition, acquisition of Indian slaves. Of Indian slaves. We're gonna teach them the gospel. We're gonna teach them about Jesus. Bible in one hand, hand, sword in the other. Nothing has changed. This is that, that video we saw is 2022. That just came out a day or two ago. Nothing has changed. Let's go back to Revelation chapter 13. Revelations chapter 13 and verse 11. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb. They dealt with politics, Democrat and Republicanism. And he spake as a dragon. But they came with religion. They come under the guise of being a Christian nation. Nothing different than what the conquistadors did to justify slavery, Native American slave trade, because the Native Americans are the children of Israel. They went through the same curses, Deuteronomy 28, 15 through 68. They went through the slave trade. They went through... Uh, um, being sold on slave ships. Oh, excuse me, being transported by way of slave ship. Deuteronomy 2868. Nothing different. In that book, they call them caravels. Those are ships. Uh, read on. Verse 12. Oh, no, no, no. No, 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 no. Now, give me the link. World Council of Churches. They had two horns like a lamb, but they spake as a dragon. Two horns like a lamb. So this is the World Council of Churches. This is their website, and this is just the about, uh, like the, about the WCC. 
So you're going to read, yes, this first one, what is, and you go, no, go back up. Yep, just that first sentence. What is, the, what is the World Council of Churches? What is the World Council of Churches? A fellowship of 352 churches from more than 120 countries. From more than where? More than 120 cr- 120 countries. 120 countries. We're not just talking about America. Christianity is in over 120 countries. Go ahead. Representing over 580 million Christians worldwide. Worldwide. White Jesus is in the brain stems of more than 580 million people. It's way more than that. Just in Africa, Africa alone, Christianity is, has flooded the entire continent. Scroll down. You're going to scroll down to the World Council of Churches. Is it? Yep. The World Council of Churches is a fellowship of churches which confess the Lord Jesus Christ as God and Savior according to the scriptures and therefore seek to fulfill together their common calling to the glory of the one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And guess what? This same, this same Jesus, this same Savior that the so-called white man pushes throughout the entire earth, they use him to justify Slave, the slave trade of the Native Americans. The slave trade of black people. Scroll down to the WCC, the WCC brings together. The WCC brings together. The WCC brings together churches, denominations, and church fellowships in more than 120 countries. More than 120 countries, go ahead. And territories throughout the world, representing over 580 million Christians and including most of the world's Orthodox churches. Sources of an Angelican, Baptist. Scores Lut- of Anglican. Anglican, Baptist, Lutheran, Methodist, and Reformed churches, as well as many united and independent churches. So all these various religions, all these various denominations make up the World Council of Churches. Go ahead. While the bulk of the WCC's founding churches were European and North American. They were what? European and North American. They were were from Edomite nations. They were born in Edomite countries. Go ahead. Today, most member churches are in Africa. Asia, the Caribbean, Latin America, the Middle East, and the Pacific. Has touched every major continent. Christianity has touched every major continent. Go ahead. There are now 352 member churches. There are now 352 member churches. Member churches. You can drop that. Revelation chapter 13, verse 12. Revelations chapter 13 and verse 12. And he exercises all the power of the first beast. So now watch this. It says, and he exerciseth all the power of the first beast. That first beast is talking about Rome. America exercises all the power of the first beast. Go ahead. Before him and causes the earth and them which dwell therein, to worship the first beast. So how do we know that that's true? Because the Christian religion is in every major continent in the world. Is in over, what was it, 120 different countries? The founding churches being in Europe and North America. Go ahead. It's a, uh, read, the, uh, read it from the top. Yes, sir. Revelation chapter 13, verse 12. And he exercises all the power of the first beast before him and causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast. To worship the first beast. To worship the white man. To worship Edom, Esau, Idumia. The entire planet, we're reading, the entire planet earth worshiping the so-called white man. Go ahead. Whose deadly wound was healed. Whose deadly wound was healed. 
When it was healed, Rome's wound was healed. They were taken down in 193 AD, and they came back, started to come back in power during the Renaissance, which is French for rebirth, which is French for rebirth. Go from there. Now, pull up those screenshots that I sent you. Uh, it's from the uh, pictorial, um, what is it? Shoot. Uh, the pictorial, pictorial, Zondervan Pictorial Bible Dictionary. That's the word I was looking for. Zondervan Pictorial Bible Dictionary. So we're going to read about Corinth. And we're just going to read the highlight portions. Can you zoom in? Let's zoom in and, and scroll down. It says, under, under the Romans, what's that word at the corner? Athens, okay, yes. Under the Romans, Athens was still the educational center of Greece, but Corinth became the capital of the Roman province they called Achaia, mm -hmm. and was the most important city in the country. Land traffic between the north and south of Achaia had to pass the city and much of the commerce between Rome and the east was brought to its harbors. So Rome, excuse me, uh, under the Romans, Athens was still the educational center of Greece. Uh, there was a lot of land traffic and trade back and forth. Read Corinth. Corinth had an ancient and very interesting history. Phoenician settlers were early attracted to it. They introduced many profitable manufacturers and established the impure worship of the Phoenician deities. Later, idolatry. So they introduced idolatry. Go ahead. Later, Greeks from Attica. Attica became supreme. They probably changed the name of the city to Corinth and glorified the games held there in honor of Poseidon, the god of the sea. So what we see... During the during in Rome, there was trade, traffic, commerce, business, and there was idolatry. Go to the next one. That's real hard to read. God damn. In Roman okay. times, Corinth was a city of wealth, luxury, and immortality. Immorality. Immorality. Sorry. So it says in Roman times. The city, uh, Corinth was a city of wealth, luxury, and immorality. Where else in the earth today is, a, is filled with luxury, wealth, and immorality? You cannot pull up YouTube without seeing. You want to make $10,000 in two hours? You want to make a million dollars in 30 minutes? You like my Bugatti? How many, how many videos you see the little uh, the little advertisements where they sitting, where they standing in front of a Bugatti, they in a BMW, they in a Mercedes, they in a mansion, uh, uh, Ty Lopez, hi Ty, whatever, whatever the hell it was, whatever they said. I forget. Read on. It had no rivals as a city of vice. It had no rivals as a city of vice or sin. Go ahead. To live like a Corinthian meant to live a life of profligacy. Profli profligacy. Yep, you was almost there. Go ahead. <laughs> and debauchery. Uh -huh. It was customary in a stage play for Corinthians to come on the scene drunk. So in, your, in, their, in their plays and stuff like that, you would come to the, how you come in there drunk? Before you even uh, say a line, you come in drunk. drunk. Go ahead. The inhabitants were naturally devoted to the worship of Poseidon. Idolatry. Since they drew so much of their wealth from the sea, but their greatest devotion was given to Aphrodite, Aphrodite mm -hmm. the goddess of love. More idolatry. Her temple on the Acrocorinthus. Ac Acrocorinthus had more than a thousand. High, I don't know. Yeah. Higher air, air dulu. Uh, Priestess of vice. Not Priestesses of sin. Go ahead. Of vice not found in other shrines of Greece, and she's attracted worshipers from all over the ancient world. 
Besides drawing vast revenues from the sea, Corinth had many important in industries. Its pottery and brass, Pot pottery, pottery and brass, especially being famous all over the world, the Ishmian, the Isthmian, Isthmian Games held every two years made Corinthian a great center of Hel Hellenic, Hellenic life. Hellenic life. So y'all see the parallels between when the Romans were in rulership, which they got there from Greece. So you had two Edomite nations back to back in rulership, Greece. And then Rome, nothing changed under the Romans. It, was, it, it, it grew worse and worse because under the Romans you had luxury, wealth, and it was full of immorality. Uh, I don't want that. Let me see what the next one says. Uh, scroll, scroll down. This the bottom? Uh, yep, read that, Hellenism. Hellenism. Scroll over. Right there. Hellenism, the civilization of culture of ancient Greece, especially the, the dissemination of adoption of Greek throughout customs and lifestyles. It says the civilization and culture of ancient Greece, especially the, the, the dissemination an adoption of Greek thought, customs, and lifestyles. Go ahead. It often implies the fusion of Greek and non-Greek culture. It often implies Greek and non-Greek cultures. That's going to be important in a minute. Go ahead. Among classical scholars, the term Hellenistic is primarily a chronological Designation. Designation covering meaning, the... Meaning it was a period of time. When they say the Hellenistic period, they're talking about a period of time. From the time that the Greeks came into rulership under Alexander the Greek. Go ahead. To the beginnings of the Roman Empire. It and says uh, primary... Uh, covering yeah, for covering the period. Yeah, read that again. I'm sorry. Covering the period from Alexander. Alexander the, the Greek. To the beginnings of the Roman Empire. To, into the Roman Empire. Go ahead. In biblical scholarship, the term has a broader connotation and is roughly equivalent to Greco-Roman. Greco-Roman. Mm. Because when Edomites in power are in power, that there's an increase in luxury, wealth, and immorality. Why? Because of what we read in Job chapter 9, verse 24. When the earth is given into the hand of the wicked, the, 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 the earth begins to crumble from the foundation up. That's when you start to see a rise of idolatry. That's when you start to see a rise in luxury and wealth, a rise in immorality. Uh, let me see if I want it. Yeah, read. Read that. When the Seleucid Empire gained control of Palestine in 198 B.C., so we're, we're talking about the times of the Maccabees. You can read this in 1 Maccabees chapter 1. Go ahead. The Jewish people came under severe pressure to Hellenize. When it says the Jewish people, the Israelites came what? Under severe pressure to Hellenize. To Hellenize or to become Greeks. And nothing different than today. You call yourselves Americans, African Americans. You will call yourself a Christian nationalist. Go ahead. The Jewish people became, excuse me, the Jewish people came under severe pressure to Hellenize, and many resisted it, leading to the Maccabean War beginning in 168 BC. The influence of Hellenism in Palestine, however, could not be totally prevented. The influence of Hellenism could not be totally prevented. Go ahead. The entrenchment of Greek culture came more readily be seen among the Jews of the diaspora, especially in Alexandria. So what is this book telling us? That when you read the scriptures, when you read Jew nor Greek, those Greeks were Hellenized Jews. This is a book you can, you can pick this up off of Amazon. You can go to, uh, what's the other bookstore? Uh, Half Price Books. Huh? 
Yeah, exactly. You could pick this up. This is readily available information. The, he- the Jews were Hellenized. They became Greeks, not by nationality, by culture, by identity. They started to identify as Greeks. They started to identify as Romans. They started to identify themselves as Roman nationalists, Greek nationalists, Christian nationalists, as we see today, for us today. Read that. Hellenistic influence is apparent early in the church's history. The book, the, the title of this book is, I don't forget the exact title, but it's the Pictorial, Zondervan Pictorial Dictionary or Pictorial Bible Dictionary, something like that. Go ahead. The term Hellenist occurs for the first time in the New Testament, Acts 6 and 1, Acts 9, 29, and eleven twenty. So they're telling you that those Greeks in the New Testament are Hellenized Jews. Hellenized Jews, Israelites. Go ahead. In the last passage, some early witnesses have Hellenius. Greeks or Gentiles. Greeks or Gentiles. Those Gentiles in the New Testament are Greek-speaking Jews, Israelites, Hellenized, taking on Greek identity. Roman identity, Greek nationalists, Roman nationalists. Go ahead. According to Acts 6 and 1, there is a dispute in the Christian community at Jerusalem between the Hebrews and the Hellenists, Grecians, Grecian Jews. Grecians, Grecian Jews, Greek Jews. So I'm showing you the correlation or the parallels from the first beast, Rome, up until today. The eighth beast, which came out of the seventh when you read Revelation 17. The seventh was Rome. The eighth beast that came out of the seventh is America. And they go back to Revelation 13 and 12. And what have they done? Revelation. I'm going going, going totally off my nose now. Uh, (laughs) uh, Read Revelation 13 and 12, then we'll get back to these. Uh, Revelation chapter 13 and verse 12. And he exercises all power of the first beast. And he exerciseth all power of the first beast, which is Rome, the luxury, the wealth, the immorality, the Hellenized Jews, the, 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 the Greek nationalists, the Roman nationalists, the Hellenized Jews. Go ahead. Before was, him. Uh, I'm sorry, was that it? No, there's more. Go ahead. And causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. Who came back into power during the Renaissance. Now, I'm not going to stray away. I'm not going to stray away. Now, let's go to, let's go to um, crazy times. So the earth has been given into the hand of the beast, as it says in Revelation. The wicked, as it says in Job 9, 24. That's why you see the rise in luxury, the rise in wealth, the rise in immorality. Now let's get the video. Now let's see what this Christian nation is all about. Crazy times we live in. Illinois, a video, TikTok video. Crazy times we live in. Did I send that to you? Thought I did. Huh? Okay. All right. So, oh, there we go. All right. If you don't know, now you know. You better pay attention because in Chicago, starting January 1st, 2023, guess what? Second degree murder, kidnapping, any of these things are no longer detainable. They will no longer put these people in fucking jail. They will arrest them, take them to court. Book them and let them go. Cash bond no longer exists in Chicago after January 1st, 2023. The purge is here, people. Illinois is going to be the new crime capital of the world. You better fucking pay attention and stop calling me a conspiracy theorist. If you don't know, now you know. So now you see the rise in immorality. The rise in crime. That's just that's Chicago. Starting January 2023, let's go to 
That next article, High Court Blocks Recognition of LGBTQ Campus. Go ahead. High Court Blocks Recognition of LGBTQ Campus at Yeshiv, what does it say? Yeshiva U. Yeshiva U. Uh, we're not gonna read the whole thing. We're gonna you're gonna read. I don't need. Uh, I didn't put this. The uh, just read. Scroll down a little bit. Just a little bit. Stop. 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 I said just a little bit. Just a little bit. Scroll up to that first sentence. Right there. Stop. 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 Court acting. Just read the university. The University of Orthodox Jewish is. Institution An in Orthodox Jewish institution in New York, Argy. Amalek, Edom, Esau, Idumia, their educational institution, go ahead, argued that granting recognition to the group, the YU Pride Alliance, would violate its sincere religious beliefs. So this group, the, the YU Pride Alliance, they were pushing for their group to be recognized in the university. So it went all the way up to the Supreme Court. Supreme Court blocked it for uh, uh, just a period of time. It's just on a temporary block. But read on. On the other side. But on the other side, so the, the, the institution, the university, which is an Orthodox Jewish institution, they said, no, we can't recognize that. It would violate their sincere religious beliefs. Go ahead. On the other side, the club said Yeshiva already has recognized a gay pride club at its local, at its law school. But they've already recognized the club. They've already recognized a gay pride club. This is Esau, Edom, Idumia, who runs the planet Earth, who says that they are a Christian nation. They want to they bring their, their nation back, give their nation back to God. Meanwhile, in their educational system, uh, in their educational institutions, they're they're recognizing gay uh, uh, gay pride clubs. The rise in immorality. Scroll, uh, not scroll. That's that's it on that. That's it on that. Uh, go from there. Go to yes. We're witnessing the poisoning of black America. So now this is, this is dealing with the water system in Jackson. We're not going to read the whole thing, and I don't think, I, I, didn't, I didn't put the sentences here either. We'll just read a little bit. Scroll down slowly for me. Uh, read that first sentence. Cascading. Cascading issues with the water supply in some of America's blackest cities are demonstrating the downstream effects of years of neglect. Of years of, in this Christian nation, years of, ne of neglect in America's blackest communities. Go ahead. Three cities in particular have been plagued with water issues lately that highlight inequality in how the public coffers are used. So three cities are plagued with water issues. Keep in mind, and these are black cities, predominantly black cities. Keep in mind, keep in mind that, uh, where's the part I wanted? Keep in mind that these are Christian, this is a Christian nation. Remember, they want to unite all religions, all nations. We all want in Christ Jesus. Well, why the hell we all want in Christ Jesus? But black people got dirty water. Black people ain't got clean drinking water in this Christian nation. Black people don't have water to bathe in. Flint, Michigan is another city. There, there was a brother, uh, the brother um, Moses West, he was talking about whenever he went to Flint and how the teachers were saying that they don't expect the, to, to see their, because he, he was speaking at an elementary school, and they were saying how they don't, the, the teachers were saying they don't expect to see the children pass junior high and high school because they would be, they are dropping dead of cancer in rapid numbers. But it's not, you won't see that on CNN. You won't see that on, on TBN 
on you know on late night when they when they do the uh, the little videos. Do you want to give and donate to the little children across the world that are hungry? Y'all need to be talking about donating right here. Right here in these black cities that don't have clean drinking water. That don't have water to bathe in. Uh, that's it on this. All right. So now, I want to show y'all that there's nothing new under the sun. The same neglect, the same immorality, the same wealth and all of that that was in the first beast, it's back. There's nothing new under the sun. The children of Israel were going through the same conditions, the same curses that you read about in the New Testament. Go to Jude, Jude verse 7 and 8. There's nothing new under the sun. All these same issues Israel was dealing with in ancient Rome. Because in the New Testament, you're reading about is that's Israel in the Roman captivity. The Romans were in power at that time. Read on. Jude verse 7 and 8. Jude verse 7. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication. Giving themselves over to what? To fornication. So Sodom and Gomorrah were cities that gave themselves over in uh gave themselves over to fornication. Jude is speaking at this time in the Roman captivity. He's comparing the Roman captivity and things that were happening in the Roman captivity to Sodom and Gomorrah. And he said it was what they gave. Uh, I'll read it again. Kevin. Yes, sir. Verse 7. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication. Giving themselves over to fornication. And going after strange Flesh. Homosexuality. Men with men, women with women. That was happening during the times of Rome. It's happening in America as you see it right now. Y'all saw homosexual marriage passed. Nothing new under the sun. Hold that. Revelation 11. Hold this. Revelation chapter 11 verse 8. Revelations chapter 11 and verse 8. I'm going to have to skip around now. Go and ahead. their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city. Which the great, the great city, which, Babylon the Great, Rome, an extension of Rome, the great city, which spiritually, I'm sorry, and their dead bodies shall lie in the street. That's the children of Israel. We're here in America. We, that's our dead bodies that are here in America, physically and spiritually. Go ahead. Which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt. Which spiritually is called Sodom, 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 and what? And Egypt. Because in Sodom, they gave themselves over to fornication and strange flesh, just like we see today. And guess what? The children of Israel are living in those times. They're living in that great city yet again. Yet again, read, uh, read on, where, where, where also, also our Lord was crucified. Where also the image of Christ, the black Messiah, was crucified. Now you have the image of white Jesus, Caesar Borgia, that is pushed throughout the earth. Re, uh, go back to Jude, verse 8. Jude, verse 8. Likewise, also, these filthy dreamers. No, no, no. I'm sorry. Verse, verse 7 again. I'm sorry. Verse 7. I just want to verse 7. I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Verse 7. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh. And going after strange flesh, homosexuality. Are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of of eternal fire. So just like Sodom suffered the vengeance of eternal fire, fire and brimstone, same uh, destruction coming to America. Same destruction, nothing different. America is spiritually Sodom, as well as Egypt. Remember, in Egypt, luxury, wealth. We were building for Pharaoh what? Treasure cities. Wealth. Being buried with your gold, being buried with your riches. That's what the pharaohs was doing. 
Go from there. First Corinthians chapter six. First Corinthians chapter six, verse fifteen. First Corinthians chapter six and verse fifteen. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? So we're going back to Corinth. Keep in mind, it's during the Roman captivity. We read about Corinth. Luxury, wealth, immorality. This is where you had these Corinthians that you're reading about, the church in Corinth. These were, Hellen, these were Hellenized Jews. These were Greeks that were in the process of repentance. They believed on Christ, but they had a hell of a lot of issues. We're getting ready to read about some of those issues right now. Go ahead. Shall I then take the members of Christ and make the members of an harlot? It says, shall I make the members of Christ members of an harlot? Go ahead. God forbid. Or a whore or a prostitute. God forbid. Why? Because in Corinth, there was a lot of sexual immorality. Their plays was sexual immorality. Immorality. They would come to the plays drunk. Go ahead. Verse 16. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two, said he, shall be one flesh. You said, uh, Paul said, know you not, know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body, one flesh, just like it said in Genesis. Go ahead. For two, said he, shall be one flesh. Flesh, uh -huh. but he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. But don't be joined to a hoe, a harlot, a prostitute. Be joined. Don't be one because you'll be one flesh. Those that are joined to the Lord are one spirit. Go ahead. Flee fornication. So you see what Paul is telling the Corinthians: flee fornication. Why? Because it would be everywhere. It would be easily accessible, just like it is in, here in America. A lot of some of y'all are getting catfished. Y'all can go to y'all phone and get catfished by, by a chick. You don't even know if she a chick. You don't even know if she, number one, you don't know if she real. Mm -hmm. let's, say, let's say she or it is real. You don't know if it's a he, she, or a she, he. All types of confusion here in Babylon. That's strange flesh. Go ahead. Flee fornication. So Paul said flee fornication. Because it would be easily accessible. Flee from it. Go ahead. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. Every other sin that you do is without your body. Uh, if you steal, you're stealing from somebody else. If you lie, you're lying to somebody else. Go ahead. But he that committed fornication. But if you commit fornication, sexual sins. Sinneth against his own body. You sinning against your own body. Now you bring upon yourself, so it's not like stealing where, okay, you steal from a brother, you got to give it back uh, 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 five times over. It's not like that. Fornication, you bring upon yourself STDs, HIV, syphilis, gonorrhea, herpes, and then you end up dropping dead from it. You sin against your own body. Go ahead. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God? And ye are not your own, for ye are brought with a price. You are bought with a price. Christ, the black Messiah, laying, out, laying down his life for the nation of Israel. You're bought with a price. Go ahead. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God. So Paul told the church in Corinth, flee from fornication, glorify God in your body, glorify God in your spirit. Go from there, Luke chapter 21. So here's what Christ said would be happening in the last days, the end of the world. When Christ was born, he lived, he was manifest to us. He taught us to repent in Rome. A prophet came back and taught us to repent. Keep that in mind. Nothing new under the sun. I'm going to have to skip around. I'm going to have to skip around. Go to Luke. Uh, I'm sorry. Go to Luke 21. Uh, read verse 7 and 8. Luke chapter 21 and verse 7. And they asked him, saying, Master, but when shall these things be? And what sign will there be when these things shall come to pass? Talking about his second coming. Go ahead. 
And he said, Take heed that ye be not deceived. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ. And the time draweth near. Go ye not therefore after them. Go ye not therefore after them. Do not follow Christianity, the religion. Why? Because many would come in my name. 352 churches. The three, don't, don't be deceived by the 352 churches. That's, that's a smoke screen. You got every church on every hood in America preaching white Jesus. Even if they do say he's black, if they're not teaching you that you're Israel and to keep God's commandments, that's an Edomite church. That's a white church. So Christ said, take heed that ye be not deceived. Because Christ saw, already knew in the last days, Rome would come back in power as America and they would push their religion to over 120 countries. You would have Christianity touch every major continent in the world. Just like John saw in Revelation chapter 13. That the beast would force the entire earth to worship his image. The image of the beast being Caesar Borgia. Uh, read, what verse? Verse, verse 8. That verse was verse 8. And, go, uh, and the time draw up there. All right. Go from, go from there. Go to... I'm going to jump. Go to Luke chapter 17. So this is, so we read about Christianity, fornication. All of these things was happening in ancient Rome. Remember, uh, go, <clears throat> excuse me, go back to Acts, Diana. Because remember, we read about idolatry. We read about idolatry when we read the book, Acts, 19? I just want, yeah, Acts 19, yes, I just want the one verse, 34. Yes, sir. Acts chapter 19 and verse 34. But when they knew that he was a Jew, all with one voice about the space of two hours, cried out, great is Diana of the Ephesians. Great is Diana of the Ephesians. Our people loved idolatry. They loved idolatry. For two hours, they yelled out, great is Diana of the Ephesians. Nothing new under the sun. Today, you love uh, Christmas, Easter, Mother's Day, Father's Day, birthdays. You love that stuff. Just because you're not crying out, great is Diana of the Ephesians, that don't mean you're not committing idolatry. If you are worshiping and serving Caesar Bourget, if you're going to the Christian church on Sunday, you're going to the Potter's House, you're going to Oak Cliff Bible Fellowship, you are committing idolatry. Because y'all will be in there for what, two hours? Y'all will be singing praise and work. Y'all got praise and worship. Then y'all might read two scriptures. And then you give your tithes and offering. It's nothing different than saying great is Diana the Ephesians for two hours. It's nothing different. Uh, um, go from there. All right, go from there. Luke, Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17. Guess what? There are brothers and sisters that are watching online right now that are stuck. You a deacon. You are a you are somewhere in senior leadership. You the church clerk. You deal with the money, or whatever it is in the Christian church. But you know you Israel. You are still worshiping the beast. You still worshiping the beast, and you have to come out of that. We're gonna we're gonna read that in a minute. I gotta I gotta speed up a little bit. Go to Luke chapter seventeen. Actually, I don't. I think I think I'm gonna. Let me say. Uh, read. I'm gonna skip through some of this. Just read verse. No, nah, I'm gonna skip all of it actually, because that's just going back to Sodom and Gomorrah. I want to get to First Kings chapter eight. So, in these last days, as we understand where we are, as we understand that there's nothing new under the sun, as you read through the New Testament, as you read through Paul's letters, and you read about. The church in Corinth committing fornication. Paul saying flee fornication. When you read, oh, 
Timothy's. That's what I wanted. The wealth and the luxury. That's what I wanted. First Timothy's. I did not put it in my, my notes. First Timothy's chapter 6. Because remember, there would be a rise in luxury and wealth. First Timothy's chapter 6. Read, start at verse 6. Yes, sir. First Timothy's chapter 6 and verse 6. But godliness with contentment. Uh, so, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Wait, 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 wait. Uh, read verse, read verse four. Yes, sir. Verse four. Read verse three. Verse read three. I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Read three, five, and then we'll read now. Yes, sir. Ver- First Timothy chapter three and verse six. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, And to the doctrine which is according to godliness, verse 5, perverse disputings of men. So these are some of the doctrine, these are some of the unwholesome words that go against the knowledge of Christ. Go ahead. Perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. So in the Christian church, what do they say? You better give your tithes and offerings because you want that seed. You want your harvest to be ripe. Whatever they be saying, I don't know. Don't you want a plentiful harvest? Not We don't need you. We can't have just the tithes. We need the offering. And we need that first fruit tithes. And I need my Rolex. And I need my jet. Read on. And they, what they tell you, that God, if you want to be closer to God, you better get that paper. Show me the money. So they're getting all the money, but then you got a bunch of broke blacks and Mexicans going back to the hood every week. Go ahead. From such, withdraw thyself. Paul said, from such, withdraw yourself. If they telling you that you're going to get a million dollars, if they, they treating the Bible like it's a, a, a lottery ticket. Well, if you scratch, you buy enough lottery tickets, huh, and you scratch enough, huh, you gonna give, you gonna hit. Your numbers gonna hit. Read on. Uh, now, what was that? Verse, verse six. Paul said, "From such withdraw thyself. Come out of the church. Come out of the church. Go ahead. Verse six. But godliness with contentment is great gain. God said, "Godliness with contentment is great gain. Be content with what you have." Just because you don't have a Bugatti, that don't mean you ain't close to God. Read on. For we brought nothing into this world. I'm sorry. Uh, let's jump. Let's jump. Let's jump for time's sake. Verse 10. Verse, verse 10. So now keep in mind, keep in mind what we read. During the, during the Greek captivity, during the Roman captivity, there was a rise in luxury, wealth, and immorality. We're dealing with the luxury and the wealth portion. I got a, and I'm going to go over it on In the Scripts Reloaded. Make sure y'all check us out every Tuesday, 7 to 9 p.m. Central Standard Time. But anyway, anyway, excuse me, shameless plug. I need some water now. God, dog. We we touched on, last week we touched on um, uh, the the decline of America. And one of of the things that, hey, Officer Jonathan, help me out. On the In the Scripts Reloaded page, you're going to see that article. You're going to see that article that says um, uh, basically the seven signs or something like that. Pull that up for me. I got a little bit of time, and I'm going to just kind of skip through some of these scriptures. So I got a little bit of time. But do me a favor and find that for me. Read this again in verse 9. First Timothy chapter 6 and verse 9. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare. They'll be trying, they'll be setting up their own um, uh, robberies. Then they would sue. I got one, thank you. Or they would sue, they would sue the people on uh in, on uh on uh social media. You got that dude in New York. The pastor that, that got robbed, 
that's now suing for $20 million. He's suing people on social media for $20 million. Crazy as hell. It says you will fall into temptation and a snare. Go ahead. And into many foolish and hurtful lusts. Go ahead. Which drown men in, de in destruction and perdition. You'll lose, you'll lose upwards of your life. Running after money. Go ahead. For the love of money is the root of all evil. The love of, because the love of money is idolatry. That's why it says it's, it's the root. Because of idolatry. When you, when you read Wisdom of Solomon, we're not going to get it. When you read Wisdom of Solomon, it's either 14 when it talks about disquieting of good, disquieting good turns, uh, adultery, so on and so forth. That's Wisdom of Solomon 14. That's all the things that come. That's, those are all the fruits of idolatry. The love of money, and it's not to say that money in and of itself is evil, but when you will break God's laws to get it, that's sin. That's evil. That's the root of evil. Go ahead. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after. Because it's covetousness. Go ahead. They have erred from the faith. They have erred. You will, you will turn from God for money. Go ahead. And pierce themselves through with many sorrows. Pierce themselves through with many sorrows. You'll sell your rent. You'll, you'll uh, sell off your house. You will not pay your rent for three or four months because you're trying to hit it on the craps table. You done, you done bought $2,000 worth of lottery tickets. That's supposed to be your food, your gas, your rent, your car note, and everything else. Um, all right, you got it for me, officer? Nope. All right, I'll, I'll find it. I'll find it. Uh, I'm going to send it over right now, right now, right now. In the, uh, I mean, it's on there too, but I can't hear you. Yes, I believe that's it. Yes, I believe so. Uh, no, 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 I'm sorry. The life cycles of empires. The life cycles of empires. I just want one part out of this. I just want one part out of that. So pull that up for us. Let's read. And this is going to go into, I, I forward it to you. All righty then. Thank you, sir. All right, pull this up. Uh, let's scroll down because I got—I don't remember where it's at. So this is an article from 2011. Scroll up a little bit. Uh, will up. Uh, scroll up. Scroll up. Scroll up. Scroll up. All the way to the top. This is the life cycles of empires. Lessons for America today. Now let's scroll down a little bit. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Um, hold up. Hold up. Scroll up. Uh, let me see. Where. Hold up. No, no, no. Stay right there. Stay right there. Scroll down. Read that. Um, yeah, read that part. If that weren't bad enough. If that weren't bad enough, the worldwide economic crisis had laid the country low with high unemployment. So keep in mind, this is 2011, and this is talking about the signs of a declining empire. Go ahead. An eminent federal government deficit. An immense federal government deficit. How, many t how long have we been talking about deficits and hearing about deficits? Go ahead. Rising inflation. We are we talking about rising inflation right now. Keep in mind, this is 11 years ago. Go ahead. And depressed home values. And depressed home values. Now, even though the home values were artificially, <clears throat> were artificially uh, uh, raised, guess what? They finna come right back down. They finna collapse. Yep. There's going to be a real estate collapse. Go ahead. Other challenges loom ahead. Following from the European... Flowing. Oh, flowing from the European Union... Flowing from the EU... Europe, go ahead. Growing political and economic in integration. Integration. Russia's increased strength and assertiveness. assertiveness and China's rapid economic, industrial, and military growth. So all of these are the signs of a declining empire. Will America follow the path of past 
Empire. Scroll down. Uh, so you see right here, didn't that happen to other great empires in the past, such as those of Britain, Spain, Rome, Persia, Babylon, and Egypt? Remember Revelation 13. Remember Revelation 13. John saw in his vision that America would, took on the characteristics of all of these, all of these empires, all of these previous empires. And the so-called white man, he's saying America is just like them because it was prophesied. Scroll down because uh, I just want one portion, one part. I don't got time to go through the whole thing. Uh, keep going, keep going, seven steps in a life cycle, life cycles of great empires, keep scrolling, okay, we're going to read about the decadence, decline and collapse, scroll down, hold up, uh, okay, later on, during the following ages, hold up, Ages of commerce and affluence, businessmen and merchants who normally value material success and dislike taking unnecessary risks, risks take over at the highest levels of society. Their societies downplay the values of soldiers. So what is it saying? That one of the signs of, of a declining empire is that there would be a high uh, status or high regard for affluence, businessmen, and merchants. Wealth and luxury. Scroll down. Okay, hold up. According to Glub, they normally do this not from motives of conscience, but rather because of the weakening of a sense of duty in citizens and the increase in selfishness manifested in the desire for wealth and ease. This is one of the, one of the signs of a declining empire. Paul had to deal with Israel with the same things. Your desire for wealth and ease, you got to dead that spirit because that's covetousness. There will be a rise in covetousness. Fornication, you got to deaden that spirit. Why? Because in the last days, just like in the days of Rome, there will be a rise in sexual immorality. Uh, go from, all right, you can scroll down. Let me see if there's any more on that. Uh, scroll down. Okay, that's it. We can drop that. There's, there's a lot of good stuff. But again, in the scripture, reload it every Tuesday, 7 to 9 p.m. Central. So let's go, let's go from there. First Kings chapter 8. So in these last days, as it was during the, time, during, uh, the Roman captivity, God would send forth prophets. God would show his children mercy. How was he sending, showing us mercy? By sending the prophets to teach us repentance. So we are not overcome by the, the rise in wealth, the rise in luxury or covetousness, the rise in sexual immorality. 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 47 through 49. 1 Kings chapter 8 and verse 47. Yet if they shall bethink themselves in the land where they were carried captives and repent. And repent. Go ahead. He said, bethink yourselves in the land of your captivity and repent. Go ahead. And make supplication unto thee in the land of them that carried them captive. In the land that you were a captive. In Greece, in Rome, in Corinth, in America. Go ahead. Saying, we have sinned. We have done perversely. We have committed wickedness. We have committed spiritual fornication. We've committed covetousness. We've committed idolatry. We've committed sexual immorality. Go ahead. And so return unto thee. With and so return unto thee. What verse you at? Verse 48. Verse 40. Was that it? Yes. Oh, okay. Just, just, we'll just read verse 40. Yes. 47 and 48. 47 and 48. So how would we bethink ourselves or let me give you out a precept for that, Baruch 2 and 30. What does it mean to bethink yourself? Baruch chapter 2, verse 30. Baruch, Baruch. chapter 2, verse 30. Baruch chapter 2 and verse 30. For I knew that they would not hear me. 
Because it is a stiff-necked people. It is a rebellious people that would be in the land of their captivity, in the land of their slavery, and they would be subject to all, all manner of sexual immorality, luxury, wealth, increase in covetousness. Go ahead. But in the land of their captives, they shall remember but themselves. But in the land of their captivities. Of their captivities, they shall remember themselves. They shall remember themselves. They shall remember themselves. Just like in every captivity in times past, God sent forth his prophets. During the times of Rome, God sent forth his son. For us today, he sent forth Elijah. In the last days, for us to remember who we were, to remember what the greatest thing walking the face of the planet, to remember that we're God's chosen people, to remember that we're his firstborn, to remember that we're the sons and daughters of God, to remember that we're kings and priests in the earth. Second Chronicles chapter 36, verse 15 and 16. Second Chronicles chapter 36, verse 15 and 16. Second Chronicles chapter 36 and verse 15. Let's get more on those prophets. And the Lord God of their fathers sent to them by his messengers, rising up but times and sending, because he had compassion on his people. That's why I said earlier, just a few minutes ago, God showing mercy to his people by sending forth his prophets. By sending forth his messengers. Go ahead. Because he had compassion on his people. Because he had compassion on his people. Go ahead. And on his dwelling place. But they his, his dwelling place is Jerusalem. Go ahead. But they mocked the messengers of God. But what did the children of Israel do? But they mocked the messengers of God. But they mocked God's prophets. Go ahead. And despised his words and mused his and prophets. misused. Misused his prophets. Until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people, till there was no remedy. So at those during those times, they went into captivity under Nebuchadnezzar, under the Babylonians. Even though God said, listen, Zedekiah, you need to li li follow Nebuchadnezzar. Listen. Zedekiah said, hell no, nah, I ain't doing that. God sent forth the prophets to teach repentance to the children of Israel. We didn't want to listen, so what happened? The Lord sent our black minds in the, cap in the captivity, in the slavery. But God said, I'm going to show mercy. And he showed mercy every captivity. He showed us mercy. How? By sending forth the prophets to teach repentance. In these last days, God is sending, sending forth cap uh, Bishop Nathaniel, Bishop uh, Yawasa, Bishop Kanai, Captain Lemuel, Officer Razzis. He's sending forth the prophets to teach his people repentance because that's the compassion that God has on his people. That's God showing his people mercy. That's God showing his people grace. Uh, go from there. Second Ezra's. I'm going to end it on these last few verses. Luke, um, uh, second Ezra's chapter 7. Uh, for time's sake, we're, gonna, we're not going to read what I wanted to read. Well, we're not going to read all that I want to read. Second Ezra chapter 7, we're going to read verse, start of verse 20. Second Ezra chapter 7 and verse 20. For there be many that perish in this life. You got to read that with power. Yes, sir. For there be many that perish in this life. God said there will be many that perish in this life. In this life. Go ahead. Because they despise the law of God that is set before them. Because they despise God's laws just like they did in the times of old. We just read 2 Chronicles 36, 15, and 16. They despised and mocked the prophets that were bringing God's word. You go all the way back to go all the way back to Genesis. They despised and mocked Mo, uh, Noah. He was a preacher of righteousness. The sons of God, the Lord showed the sons of God mercy by sending forth the prophet Noah, a preacher of righteousness. 
The Lord shows mercy to his people in every captivity. Because he knows that as time goes on, the earth would go grow weaker and weaker. Iniquity would abound. Sin would abound. So the Lord said in these last days, I'm sending forth the prophets. But, but what happened? They, dis, they despise his law, so God said they're going to perish. Yes, jump, down, jump to verse 59, just for time's sake. Verse 59. So when you read the verses before it, starting at verse 46, Ezra is, is he's, 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 he's meditating. He's like, damn. If Moses, if, Lord, why did you, he's asking all these questions. Why did you give the earth to Adam just for him to sin and we all be subject to death? Wasn't it better if you just had not get, given him a, not given him that earthly body, that fleshly body, or that carnal body, or that natural body, as it says in 1 Corinthians 15, and you just made him not to sin? That wasn't God's plan. He's, God is the potter. He made the clay however you want to make it. Who are you to, to, to reply against them. Um, so when you re, when you jump down to verse fifty, so read verse fifty nine. Second. So Ezra. so the answer was, listen, man, this is a condition of the battle. You got to fight. This life I built you to fight, and I'm not gonna put more on you than you can bear. But this is the this is the condition of the battle. In this life, you got to fight. Verse fifty nine. Second Ezra chapter seven and verse fifty nine. For this is the life whereof Moses spake unto I'm, the people. I'm sorry. Because the times of old, I gave you the earth freely. And guess what? Adam chose to sin. He chose to go against that. So guess what? Now, now his whole line got to uh, punish for that, got to be punished for that. And he's going to come back and he's going to fix what he messed up in the beginning. And he's going to be the offering for his chosen people. He's going to be the ultimate sacrifice. He still got to pay for what he did. But within him, but within that punishment or within that judgment, he's going to give his body as a sacrifice. Just like Adam received the sacrifice. Just like he received the coats of skin in the beginning. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm going to go left with that. All right, verse 59. Verse 59. For this is the life thereof, whereof Moses spake unto the people while he lived, saying, choose thee life. That thou mayest live. So you have a choice in this life. Choose life. You have a choice. Just like the prophet Moses, he gave Israel the laws in the wilderness. He said, listen, y'all got a choice, man. Y'all can choose life or choose death. Go ahead. Nevertheless, they believed not him. Yet again, just like during the times of Babylon, during the times of the Persian and Medes, during the time, uh, Assyria, Persian and Medes, Greek, Roman captivity, America. It says what? Nevertheless, they believed not him, nor yet the prophets after him. No, nor me, which have spoken unto them. Nor me, a prophet, Ezra, that has spoken before them, that has tried to teach them the laws of God. Nehemiah 8 and 8, I gave them the sense and caused them to understand the reading. They don't want to understand. They don't want to get it. They don't want to have a clue. There's only a remnant that will get a clue. There's a remnant of Israel, the chosen few, that will make the choice to live. You got to make that decision. Are you going to live a life of luxury here in Rome, a.k.a. America? Or are you going to fight to get the real riches, the kingdom of heaven? Are you going to lay up your treasures here on earth? Or are you going to lay up your treasures in heaven? Read on. Verse 61. That there should not be such a heaviness in their destruction as shall be joy over them that are persuaded to salvation. You are persuaded. We persuade our people with the scriptures. We, pers we persuade our people to salvation through the scriptures. Because there's going to be more joy in salvation than the, the, the little pleasures that you have here on earth. Uh, jump down for time's sake. We're going to end it on these last few verses. Actually, read on because we're going to end it with these. Yes, sir. I answered then and said, I know, Lord, that the Mosai is called merciful, and that he had mercy upon them 
which are not yet come into the world, and upon those also that turn to his law. And that so God said he has mercy on them that turn to his law. How would we return to the law in these last days? By bethinking ourselves, remembering who we are in the land of our captivities. By listening and taking heed to the prophets. That's why a lot of you, uh, a lot of you uh, brothers and sisters that don't like to take correction from the prophets, you will be the one, like it said in 2nd Ezra chapter 7 verse 20, that will perish because you despise the laws of God. Because you despise correction. Because you hate to be told what to do. You choose your worldly family over your family in the truth. You choose not to grow in the spirit. Everything is about a choice. Go ahead. Verse 64. And that he is patient and long suffering and long suffereth those that have sinned as his creatures. Because he understands that we were born in the sin shaped in iniquity. That death was ushered into the world with Adam's sin. Go ahead. And that he is bountiful, for he is ready to give where it needeth. And that he is bountiful, for he is ready to give where it needeth. He is ready to give mercy when it's needed. Give grace when it's needed. Go ahead. And that he is of great mercy, for he multiplies more and more mercies to them that are present and that are past, and also to them which are to come. Why does he need to give us more and more mercy? Because iniquity would abound in these last days. Such as like has never been seen in the earth. Y'all ain't seen nothing yet. Y'all think it was bad in Greece? Y'all think it was bad in Rome? Y'all ain't seen nothing yet. The Lord has to multiply his mercy in these last days. Because he already know it's going to be hell in order for, for them to get to heaven. They got to go through hell. I gave it to them freely in the beginning. They rejected it. So now they got to go through hell in order to get to heaven. Go ahead. For if he shall not multiply his mercies, the world will not continue with them that inherit therein. He said, if I don't show them mercy, the world would not continue with them that inherit therein. Everybody would die. Just like he almost did it in, the, uh, in Genesis 6 during the flood. Six and seven. But he showed mercy. He showed mercy to the righteous. Just like in these last days, God will show mercy to the righteous, those that turn to his law. Go ahead. And he pardoneth. And he pardoneth or forgiveth. For if he did not, so of his goodness, that they which have committed iniquities might be eased of them. The ten thousandth. Part of men should not remain living. He said everything would die. If I don't show them mercy, everything and everyone in the earth would die. I have to show my people mercy. It's going to get worse in these last days. We saw Y'all saw the videos. Homosexuality, rape, uh, armed robbery, burglary, all of those things. And right now, this is one city. That's the purge called The Purge. If you have not seen the movie The Purge, go watch The Purge. That is the beginning of The Purge. Christ said all these things must come to pass, and then the end would come. Then The end for Edom, Esau, Idumea, is the beginning of Jacob in rulership, the children of Israel in rulership, the rightful lords of the earth, the rightful rulers of the planet earth, and we will rule in righteousness, in true judgment. So I pray that you brothers and sisters keep get your mind right, get your spirit right in these last days. Do not be overcome by immorality, luxury, wealth, the cares of this world, the affairs of this life, pleasure, ease, and all that. This is not your rest. America is not your rest. What is the nation? Nation is men leading by example. Nation is family. Nation is community. Nation is children with 
Europa.